Welcome to the Seth Thibodeau Show with Nichols head baseball coach Seth Thibodeau. Presented by State Farm Insurance. Contact your local State Farm agent today and get to a better state with State Farm Insurance. Welcome to the debut of the Seth Thibodeau Show presented by State Farm Insurance. I'm your host, Mike Wagenheim. Each week, we're joined here by the second-year head coach of the Nichols baseball team, Seth Thibodeau. I want to welcome you to the program. We appreciate you taking the time to join us here each and every week. Colonel's off to a fantastic start this season. I don't think you could have hoped for much more. No, I'm mean, very excited about it, and, and I'm excited about where we're, the position we're putting ourselves in at this point in the season. And, and knowing that we can play better, it's a very exciting time for us. Well, each week that you join us here, we'll take a look at the uh, highlights from the previous week's games. We'll start with the Southland Conference opener. Nichols opening up league play Friday night, taking on Southeastern Louisiana in the first of a three-game set. Nichols was picked to finish near the bottom of the league this year, while the Lions were predicted to be title contenders. Both clubs came into this series hot, with the Lions off to a 10-3 and start, and Nichols having won five of their previous six. Let's take you to Didier Field in Thibodeau. 37-minute rain delay before this one got underway. The Colonels went with their ace, Seth Webster is off to a tough start this year. Southeastern's Brock Hebert gives his club the lead in their first at-bat as he pokes this base hit up the middle, chasing in Harry Slade. Hebert was batting 448 through the weekend. Hebert moves up on a stolen base and an error, and then Jonathan Pace delivers a leg double to score Hebert. Pace is the team's leader in RBIs this season. Colonels have had a, a habit of falling behind early this year. Southeastern strikes again, coming up here against Webster. Lad Rhodes at the bat, and he drops one in front of Mike Barba in center field. Pace comes around his score from second base and Rhodes with a four for five day at the plate in the league opener. Nichols was down three to nothing before even getting a look at the Lions starter Joseph Kuhn, the right-hander. He retired the side in order in the first, but Nichols comes through in the second with two on and two gone. Evan Weibel drives it the other way. Weibel had entered that at bat just one for 18 on the year. He makes this one count. Colonels cutting into the deficit now. It's 3-2 Southeastern. Webster would get a double play ball. He escapes the third, and then Blake Bajeron for the Colonels ties it with a sack, a sack fly before Bo Falk comes through with a run-scoring single. This plates Michael LaGrange. Nichols up 4-3. Falk with a three-hit game. That's multi-hit game number six for the Houston native. Nichols was not done. An 0-2 pitch to Austin Flores, and he rips it to left. Falk comes around. Five to three Colonels, and that bounced Kuhn from the ball game. He lasted just two and two third innings, five earned runs on five hits. So Southeastern head coach JRT goes to his bullpen. In comes right hander Colby Manuel to take his place. He'd get out of that inning. Top of the fourth now, close play as Brett Hoffman hits it sharply to Flores. Colonels try for the lead runner Rhodes. He's ruled safe. Runners at the corners with just one out. That set things up for Ben Hernandez. Perfect execution here of the safety squeeze, and that pulls Southeastern within one. The next batter is Slade, and he laces one. Seth Webster stabs at it off his glove. Hoffman coming around. The throw here from Barba offline, and we are tied up at five. Now it remains that way until the bottom half of the fifth inning. Falk doubles to lead off. Flores singles into third. And Weibel notches a sack fly. That's his third run batted in of the night. He comes into the weekend with just two on the season. And Nichols regains a lead. They'd add to it. Men on first and second, two outs. Philip Lyons coming through with the RBI hit. And that would chase Manuel from the ball game. Nichols now up by a score of 7-5. to five. Webster got himself a quality start. He bows out after six innings. Bottom of the seventh. And the pass ball here. Off of Jacob Fisher's mitt, scores Barbet. It's 8-5 to five in favor of Nichols. Colonels looking to put it away. Bajeron facing Tanner Rainey. Rockets one to the track and left. Lions and Jeremy Hill score. Bajeron with a three RBI evening. The Colonels have busted it wide open. It's 10-5. to five. But Southeastern, a tough ball club, and they are not going away here. Mike Sook puts two away in the eighth before Hernandez lifts it over the infield. Rhodes scores from second base, and the lead is cut to four. Sook would walk the next two batters to load him up. So Seth Thibodeau going to his bullpen here. He brings in Donnie White to take the place of Sook. First batter to face him is Hebert. 
Good matchup here, but Hebert gets the better of Donny. He belts one to the wall in left center. Hernandez and Slade come home. Hebert with a big night. The Colonel advantage is down to one run. But on comes Juco transfer Jordan McCoy to save the day. He gets pace to fly out to end the threat in the eighth. Then with runners at the corners in the ninth, he's on to face Hoffman. Sticky situation here, but McCoy able to get out of it. A double play ball, six to four to three. Nichols hangs on for the 10 to nine victory. Save number four for Jordan McCoy this season. Coach Tim, the Colonels got off to such a sluggish start in Southeastern uh, Southland Conference play last year. This just had to be a huge weight off your shoulders to get the victory here on opening night. Yes, it was. To be 1-0, to, to do it against your in-state rival, to do it against another state team, and, and to do it the way we did in front of a great crowd. And, and you know, we faced a little adversity with the weather. Webster didn't have his best stuff, but our guys continue to battle and, and believe that they can do it, and, and you saw the product there. Let's take a look at game number two of this set. This series shifting to Pat Keneally Diamond in Hammond. Lefty Jordan Hemel getting the assignment for Southeastern. This time around, though, it's the Colonels who would enjoy the early advantage. Tough week for Jeremy Hill. He gets a job done, though, in the top of the first. This two-run hit chases in Barba and Lyons. That would be all, though, for Nichols for a while. Hemel comes back strong, fanning the next two batters. Bajeron there. He sets a career high with 10 strikeouts on the afternoon. Here he gets LaGrange swinging and missing. Patrick Shreve rolling for the Colonels until Cody Gogler takes him deep. First long ball of the year for Gogler, only the second home run allowed by the pitching staff this year, so the lead is cut in half. Top of the sixth inning, two runners in scoring position. It's Austin Flores slapping one past Hoffman at third. Bajeron scores. LaGrange moves up. Nichols ahead three to one. Next batter, Evan Weibel, lays down the safety squeeze to plate LaGrange. Hemail goes seven, gives up four runs on seven hits. Shreve was outstanding. Seven innings, one run, six strikeouts. He gets Hoffman to ground into the twin killing to end the sixth inning here. It's four to one Nichols, bottom eighth. Brad DeLott working to Lad Rhodes. The RBI ground out here would bring in pace, and the cushion is down to two. But with a runner on third, Jordan McCoy fans Hoffman on the pitch in the dirt. The Lions put two on in the ninth, but McCoy shuts the door again. Pace flies out to LaGrange, and Nichols clinches the series with a 4-2 win on Saturday. That marked the first home loss for Southeastern in nine games this year. So you clinched the series on Saturday, and you got to be feeling good about yourself. Well, I'm feeling very good about ourselves. We hadn't played our best ball, but we're battling. We're pitching it well and making the clutch double play that we did those two, the two games in a row. So I'm excited going coming back home for game three in a really good situation. Well, let's take you to it. Nichols going for the sweep on Sunday. We're back at Didier Field. Mike Wise Carver on the hill. He's thrown the ball well this season, but no wins to show for it quite yet. Wise Carver gets some help from his defense in the first. Two runners in scoring position, one out. Jonathan Pace flies out to mid-range center. Michael Rutland tagging up from third, and the throw from Mike Barber cuts him down. He's roadkill. Folks were scoreless until the bottom half of the third inning. Philip Lyons at the bat here for the Colonels facing Josh Janway. Weibel on third. Brock Abair ranges over, but can only get a piece of it. Lyons leading the club in hitting this year. Now, Wise Carver was absolutely dealing. Southeastern finally striking here in the sixth inning. Pace singling through the left side. That scores Hebert, who stole both second and third in the inning. One of three hits for Pace on the day, and we're tied at one after the RBI single. Bottom of the sixth inning. Two gone here. Runners at the corners. Both Falk at the plate. The Colonels try to get Michael LaGrange in a rundown in between pitches in an attempt here to score Blake Bajeron. But Southeastern plays it perfectly. And they wind up picking off Bajeron at third. Brock Hebert waiting for the perfect time. Throws it back. And they pick off Bajeron. We're still square after six innings. An error opens the door for Nichols in the seventh. And Mike Barba delivers. This one is just out of the reach of Rhodes in right, or in left field, rather. Barba gets three bases out of the deal. Pinch runner Matt Richard and David Zorn both score. The Colonels are up 3-1 to one and are closing in on the sweep. But Southeastern would have other ideas. Eighth inning, second and third for Cody Gogler. Slow roller here. Flores able to keep it on the infield, but it scores a bear, and we've got a one-run game. Now, Brad DeLott would take over for Wise Carver. Good job again by Mike in this one. DeLott on to get the Colonels out of a tight spot, and he would have a chance here against Ladd Rhodes. A bad squeeze butt, and the Colonels have a shot at the runner at home, but DeLott misfires. 
Pace scores on the error were tied at three. Southeastern scored two more in the inning. They take a 5-3 to three lead into the ninth. Stefan Lopez polishing off Zorn here. Two innings save for Lopez. He fanned for Southeastern coming from behind. They salvaged the finale with a 5-3 to three victory. Coach, I know you were gunning for that sweep. You take two out of three. Hopefully still feeling good about yourselves, but knowing that sweep was, was within reach. There. The sweep was definitely in re within reach. We were six outs away from it. If they were, you know, hindsight 2020, uh, there was a couple of things I wish I could take back and help my, you know, put my team in a different situation, but I didn't. We can all learn from it as a club and as a program, and next time we're in that situation, I feel pretty good about it. You know, one of your fans made the comment after the game. He said, what do you call a team that wins two out of three every weekend? Champs. Conference champions. Exactly. <laughs> so we'll definitely shoot for that. Tuesday night, non-conference action. Nichols facing UNO in New Orleans. Let's take a look at the footage from May Street Field. Mike Sook got the ball in this one. The Colonels look to seize control early in this ball game, scoring a run in the seventh, eighth, and ninth. They were up seven to two, but this was a wild one, Coach. UNO plays five runs in the ninth to force extras. Nichols winds up with an eight spot in the 11th, winning by a final of 15-7. to seven. This game was completely nuts, Coach. It absolutely was, and, and tip your hat to you and no, but what, you, what I told my team after the game, I was really proud of them for not panicking, but you got to understand that this game's never over. With a couple of swings of the bat, a walk here and there, here, and the next thing you know, we're tied up instead of, 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 a, of a game that should be over with. But for our guys not to panic and come back and turn right around and, and dominate the baseball game at the end was very exciting. Colonels uh, pick up the non-conference victory. You played better on the road this year than you have at home. Right? We really have, and you know, uh, we had a great record at home last year, so all we talked about all fall and leading up to the season was trying to become a dominant road team and, and being able to enjoy playing on the road. Well, I think we've, we've definitely accomplished that, but now we need to make sure we're dominant at home as well. Well, the Colonels able to take two out of three from Southeastern. You knock off UNO as well. You'll face Sam Houston. We'll talk more about that coming up later in the program. Coming up on the Seth Thibodeau Show, Coach Tibb takes you on a tour of the new look Didier Field. We'll be right back. There goes Dwayne's car. There goes Dwayne's house. And there goes Dwayne. Man, that thing does not like the way. State Farm's got you covered. In Thibodeau, call Doug Robichaux. And in Luling, call Keith Davis. Get to a better state. Even the most charming of stadiums lose their luster and ability to attract fans, but one coach is changing his simple turf to an intricate diamond. While improvements to Ray E. Didier Field have been ongoing for a few years, the ballpark looks quite different now than it did just nine months ago. Head coach Seth Thibodeau surveys the enhancements and believes the park's new atmosphere will lure fans back in. You'll see behind me here, we've got all brand new wooden fencing down the sides. We did that this past fall. We also got some fencing on the outside of the park. We've planted some magnolias down the lines here. To try to beautify the park, we, we've also added some palms in and around the stadium on the back side of the outfield wall just to do everything we can to beautify the park. And when you come out here and walk on our field or walk around and, and sit in the bleachers, you'll, you'll, you'll have a, a really neat atmosphere here. What I always want is for my college ballpark to, to have a feel of, of spring training, so to speak, like in the big leagues. So, when you guys come out here, you'll certainly enjoy the, the looks of the place because it absolutely looks amazing right now. If you walk further along here, you'll see we've added new bleachers, almost 1,500 seats of, of all chair back seating, uh, which you know does nothing but help beautify the park as well, and it, it helps us accommodate great crowds. I mean, what, what's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with getting a, a cold drink and sitting out in the outfield at a good ball college baseball game. Uh, also, on the other side, you'll see that we, we've added bleachers on that side as well. Probably the best seat in the house, in my opinion, is right over there down the right field line next to our, our cooking area down there with the coaches committee. So it, it's really neat. We've also added fencing down there. And, and what you'll see from a distance here 
is you also see that our, our right field party deck, which is no one else has what we have there. It's it's absolutely beautiful. Thanks to uh, Duplantis Design, it's it's absolutely amazing. Also, our our campus maintenance staff that did, did a wonderful job putting that that thing together. So that's really exciting and rewarding. And wherever fans choose to sit and enjoy the game, Didier Field's newest addition, added just before opening day, will keep them informed. We've also added a video board uh, down down just underneath the scoreboard where we can pretty much flash anything we'd like to have up there and lineups and advertisements and time and just a lot of little things that really help out a lot and I have to thank the guys over at Bayou Science for really helping us uh, with that project as well. I just think it adds a whole lot to our park and it's really neat to have and it's something that not a lot of teams in our, in our league have. While the video board certainly enhances the game day experience for the fans, bettering the conditions for the players was a critical step as well. Also on the, on the infield, uh, we, we totally re our infield this past summer and, and thanks to Chack Bay, Chack Bay Nursery and Mike Reshore, we gutted out the entire area, fixed the sprinkler systems and, and re and, and reformed up our infield uh, area. So it plays true. I'm not sure that it had ever been done before, but it was something that definitely needed to be done this summer and we definitely did that. And you can see a huge difference in, 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 in the way the game is played on our infield now. None of these upgrades would have been possible without the generous support of the Nichols community, and Thibodeau will continue to lean heavily on friends of the program to take the process to the next level. We've had some great sponsors. I'm very appreciative of the people that help. They do so much, and for us, it's tough to continue to ask um, the same people over and over, hey, I need this, hey, I need this, hey, we need this. We need to expand, broaden our horizons a little bit and, and, and go out and attack others as well as the same ones that we keep hitting up year in and year out. We do have some help. I don't like asking the same people over and over and over again for the same help, so it's one of my goals to make sure that I get out and find some new donors and some new fans for Nichols Baseball and, and get them here and get them to be motivated about a wonderful university and a wonderful baseball program. As he continues to cultivate critical relationships, Thibodeau hopes his vision for the future of Didier Field will spring to life. I just feel like that it is my job. I was hired here to make things better than they were when I got here. And I feel like the more that I do, the better I'll, I'll prepare this, this, this program and the stadium for, for future generations. And, and it's, it's important for me to do that because I want this to be, I want Nickel State to be a champion. I don't want when people come out here to say this is, oh, that's just Nickel State's park. I want when people come out here, they can't wait to get back out here. And, and so it takes everything. It takes a team effort. It takes everyone involved. And, and it certainly, that's where we've gotten to this point. So hopefully here in the next two to three years, you have a brand new entrance to the park. You have a new concession stand here. You have a new press box here with a canopy. You have new dugouts here. With new dugouts, maybe we can add more bleachers and decks here. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And, and every year, this place is going to look better. Every year, I can guarantee you that. But it's the reason why it needs to look better is because we need more fans. We need more support. Even as Thibodeau plans the next steps in Didier Field's evolution, he is thankful for all those who have made the most recent round of advancements possible. I would really like to add a little monument area of some, you know, we've, we've got a ton of tradition here. I'd like to have a monument put up for Coach Calmees. I'd like to have a monument put up for uh, Scott and Jerry Sanders. Uh, I'd have, like to have something put up for Mike Moeller and Daryl Hamilton and Justin Spire. And, and the list goes on and on of all the former players that have been here. But one thing that we have to do and we're going to need some help and we need to get this done as soon as we possibly can is we've got to correct our, our press box issue and we certainly need to do that in a hurry. With the Colonels off to a solid start this year, now is as good a time as any to enjoy the new look of Didier Field. Both the team and the ballpark have been works in progress, but players and fans are now beginning to enjoy the fruits of Thibodeau's labor. For the Seth Thibodeau Show, I'm Ashley Bull. Thank you very much, Ashley. Coming up on the Seth Thibodeau Show, Philip Boudreau takes you around Nichols Athletics on the Colonel Connection. More with Coach Tibb as well. Stay with us. We're coming right back. There goes Dwayne's car. There goes Dwayne's house. And there goes Dwayne. Man, that thing does not like Dwayne. State Farm's got you covered. In Lockport, call Ashley Barrios. And in Homa, call Travis Gravois. Get to a better state.
football program made history. The men's club rounded out in an inspiring season. Softball tested their might against LSU, and the football team found new ways to bond. That and more on this week's Colonel Connection. The women entered the Southland Conference Tournament as the eighth seed. They squared off against first-seeded Central Arkansas. The women came out swinging to squash Central Arkansas 79-59. With that win, the women marched on to their first postseason win in program history. Nichols advanced to the semifinals to face Stephen F. Austin. SFA edged Nichols 66-57. The women ended their season with the most wins in program history and a bright future. The softball team's early struggles only continued at LSU. The Colonels could only muster four hits against the Tigers. The Tigers blew past the Colonels in the fifth inning to secure a 10-2 victory. The women head in the conference play this week against Sam Houston and Texas Arlington. Head coach Angel Santiago anticipates the Colonels will turn the corner in Southland action. We have a lot of, of ladies that are kind of upset about the, the, you know, the, pre, you know, the beginning results of the year. So you should see a, a much sharper, much cleaner game. The men's tennis team achieved their first national ranking in program history. The 71st ranked Colonels would come out flat though in their matches against USC Upstate and Louisiana Lafayette. Head coach Minakshi Sindaram saw that their national ranking became a blessing and a curse. What the guys didn't realize I think is the significance of that achievement. They had no clue that very, very few teams, you know, they can go for years without getting ranked. And the women's tennis team also dropped their match against the Spartans, but defeated the Cajuns in the next game. The ladies host Louisiana Tech this Sunday at 10 a.m. Despite an injury-riddled season, the men's basketball team still managed to secure a spot in the Southland Conference Tournament. Eight-seeded Nichols took on first-seeded Texas Arlington in the first round, and the Mavericks overpowered them with a 96-48 win. Nichols goes into the offseason trying to get healthy for the next campaign, but they weren't the only ones playing hoops this week. The football team participated in a three-on-three -three tournament dunk and free-throw shooting contest last Saturday. Head coach Charlie Stubbs didn't want his team to lose their competitive edge during the offseason. Stubbs has also lined up other sports for his club to engage in. Junior LaQuentin Caston looks most forward to having the opportunity to play dodgeball. Uh, dodgeball is another way to compete against your teammates and everything. So, and I do got a couple shots I want to take at some players. In addition to playing other sports, the team has also spent some time giving back to the community. A group of coaches and, and about nine players went out to Napoleon Primary School and just uh, talked to the kids about the importance of good behavior and also doing well in school. For the Seth Thibodeau Show, I'm Philip Boudreaux with your Colonel Connection. Thank you very much, Philip, here with the head coach Seth Thibodeau of the Nichols baseball team. You go into this weekend taking on Sam Houston State in conference play. What's the game plan heading in? Well, the game plan, obviously, we're going to try to stick to the same, and, and we're, going to, we're going to need to pitch a little bit. We're going to have to play defense. Those are the two main uh, characteristics of our team that have to get better. And if we can do that, we can, we can compete for, for something big. And, and it's something I want to see us do a lot better job of because I feel like we're going to be offensive because we can run and we can do some things that, to move the baseball. Uh, but Sam Houston's a very talented club, one that can really pitch. They beat some big teams this year. Um, so, you know, we, we, if we take care of the baseball and play our game, I feel like we can compete with anyone in our league, and, and certainly I don't think anything will change this weekend. The, uh, the hype surrounding Seth Webster was, was pretty big going into the year, and rightfully so. Sure. The, the year he put together last season, the feel-good story after missing two years. Do, do you think the hype has been a little bit too much for him right now? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it has been too much, but it certainly it, it hasn't helped any at all. He's definitely got a, a lot of attention, a lot of attention around campus, which is it's exciting for him. I want our guys to experience that. Um, but I, I'd like to see Seth do a few things different. I think there's a couple things we can work on to maybe maybe be, have some more success there. But we've got to play defense behind him as well. And, you know, Seth's also had some, some big innings pitched for us this year as well. So uh, there's a couple things I'd like to see different we're going to work on and tweak and, and, and try to make him even better than, than he is. But for him to still compete and give us five, six innings and not have his best stuff, that's very exciting. So, hey, we're, we're still just a month into the season. Um, but if we're still in this boat you know, four or five weeks from now, then I'll be really concerned. But just as my team doesn't and, and Seth doesn't, I'm not going to panic about it. I'm just saying we're going to work a little bit harder and see if we can make things better.
sometimes folks forget that these kids, uh, they're not kids, they're young, they have, have personal lives as well. And I know Jeremy Hill struggled at the plate last weekend. We we're all trying to figure out why. And, right. Well, he proposed to his girlfriend after Sunday's game, and I guess yeah. that was weighing on his mind <laughs> all weekend long. I know you would rather have him do it during midweek, maybe? I would love for him to do it uh, outside of baseball season, but now that it's over, I can take a deep breath. You know, you learn something new every year in coaching, and you never know where the road may take you. And to see a young man on your team take a knee and, and propose to his, one of our other athletes, a softball player here, Megan Gaspar, it's a new thing for me. So it's a new experience for me. And I'm, I'm really, Jeremy's, you know, he's been a great hitter up until last weekend. And it seems like that may have had a little effect on him. But it's over with now. And, and we'll, we'll see the real Jeremy come out the next few weeks. What's been the biggest surprise for you through the first, uh, we're now a month into the season? Uh, the biggest surprise to me is, is that, uh, you know, us not really taking care of the baseball the way I'd like to. Um, I thought that'd be a strength of ours. Of course, we're dealing with injuries. And we had to move guys around. Um, but the exciting thing is, I'm on the flip side, my team doesn't really panic in tough situations. And, th and that's, I don't know if it's as much a surprise as it's exciting for me, but I feel like it, it may be that way because we have several seniors on the field and a lot of you know, upperclassmen in the dugout that they never seem to panic when things go wrong. Like you stated earlier, our guy, we may be, we, we've, we've fallen down. In several games this year, uh, you know, two nothing, three nothing early on the road at home, both, and our guys always seem to respond and throw that punch and get us right back where we need to be to be successful. Um, so it's and it, it goes along the lines of me telling our guys we control the outcome of games by doing what we do, and, and that certainly held true for the first 17 games of the season, whether we won or won them or lost them. But I like where we're at right now. We can shore up a few things, and we have a chance to do something special. Coach, we're going to have fun following this season with you. It's an exciting club, Mike. Thank you. Debut edition of the Seth Thibodeau Show. Don't forget, for tickets for this weekend's games and all future home games, give us a call on our ticket hotline, 985-448-4790. That's 985-448-4790. Or go to our official ticket website, Ticketmaster.com. The Colonels will host Sam Houston State Friday at 6.30, Saturday at 2, Sunday at 1. We saw earlier... What a beautiful new look Didier Field has had. If you haven't seen it yet, come on out and enjoy it. Didier Field here on the Nichols campus. For more information on Nichols Athletics, check out our official website anytime, G-E-A-U-X, GoColonels.com. For Ashley Bull and Philip Boudreaux, I'm Mike Wagenheim. We'll talk to you again next week. The Seth Thibodeau Show has been brought to you by State Farm Insurance. Contact your local State Farm agent today and get to a better state with State Farm Insurance. This has been a presentation of the Colonel Sports Network.